Chapter 22. We left Bunnyman saying, oh, no, 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 I work alone. <laughs> now the scene switches back to Ombrick. Chapter 22, one mystery begets another. Teeth marks, Ombrick said again. But whose teeth marks? His beard twirled as he pondered. His exclamation echoed throughout the village. The creatures of the forest bristling with pent up energy after being trapped as toys for so long, joined forces to help Ombrick search for clues. Dragonflies and moths flew through every inch of the forest. Spiders and ants crawled into every hidden nook in Big Root. Birds and squirrels checked the treetops. The parents too joined the search, combing through every home and every yard, upending mattresses and vegetable gardens, all looking for Ombrick's library. It disappeared before Pitch could grab it. Ombrick examined the gnawed pieces of paper with his microscope. Who would eat my books? Nightlight had some hand in it, I'm sure, but what he wondered. He pressed his fingers against his temples, not wanting to admit it. But his last journey through time had taken a great toll on him. Oh. The long, slow process of releasing the entire village from Pitch's spell had added to his weariness. For the first time in his very long life, Ombrig felt not old, but ancient. But he couldn't swallow in his unfamiliar field couldn't wallow in this unfamiliar field. The children needed him, old or not. So he shook away his fatigue and examined the paper scraps again, thinking Mr. Quirty would never allow. And he stopped in mid-sentence, his eyebrows, beard, mustache, hair, shoes, and even his eyelashes began to twirl. Mr. Quirty, Holmberg shouted, leaping up, Mr. Quirty, Mr. Quirty. He hadn't seen the glowworm since he returned to the village, and now he knew the reason. Mr. Quirty has eaten my books to keep them out of Pitch's hands. First things first, he remembered what the owls had said. They saw a flash of light before everything had gone dark. Ombrick opened the box where the moonbeam rested and asked, was Nightlight holding anything when Pitch took him away? The moonbeam, sensing Ombrick's excitement, grew strong himself and glowed, yes. Was it white, rather oblong, about the size of my hand? The moonbeam pulsed twice, that's it. Ombrick said, sitting back down with a knowing nod, Mr. Quirty ate the books. Then he wrapped himself in a cocoon. Nightlight's flash of light protected the children and gave Mr. Quirty time to eat the books. The little fellow was always hungry for knowledge, but this is epic. Ombrick was almost laughing now. Night like took Mr. Quirty. He has him still. The library is in Mr. Quirty's stomach. The old wizard stroked his still twirling beard right under Pitch's nose. Chapter 23, The Honk of Destiny. We will never know what furious argument might have followed Bunny Mun's insistence that he go to the Earth's core without North and Catherine for the incredibly tense seconds after the puka had made his declaration, Kailash came waddling into the chamber and honked loudly. They all three turned and looked at the goose, North with some irritation, Catherine with concern, and Bunnymund with complete and total awe. Is this one of the great snow geese of the Himalayas, Bunnymund asked, his nose not twitching, but sort of rotating. It's slowly in amazement. Yes, her name is Kailash, Catherine told in hesitancy, a little rattled by the rabbit's shift in interest. She thinks I'm her mother. 
I was there when she hatched. The puka inhaled deeply. Tell me everything, he said. Was the egg very beautiful? North, what is every impulse not to shake some sense into this strange, long-eared creature? Time was tumbling by and the rabbit wanted to talk about eggs. But North's calmer self sensed an opportunity. Tell him about the blasted egg, he said, motioning to Catherine to hurry. Tell him about the blasted egg. Catherine put an arm around Kailash's slender neck. Well, her egg was large and silvery with swirls of pebble-sized bumps that glistened like diamonds and opals, she said. Oh, as I've always imagined it come, Bunny Munn said, pointing to his egg museum. One of the shells had an empty space labeled the Malian Great Snow Goose. It's the one egg I don't have. My collection is not complete. He stared at Catherine. It's silvery, you say? Silvery and blue, Catherine elaborated. The puka could scarcely contain himself. Kailash would be grateful to anyone who did as we asked, Catherine said. Kailash would be grateful to anyone who did as we asked, Catherine said. The puka was almost quivering. After a long moment, his former reserve seemed to return. His nose twitched. Then he spoke. My army is already assembled. I am at the ready, as I hope you are. Any friends of the great snow geese are friends of mine. Come this way. We'll take tunnel number 1728. And he paused dramatically, then added with a flourish, straight to the earth's core. Finally, North grumbled, placing his hand on the hilt of the magic sword. The weapon began to glow. Buddymon's egg relic did the same. Chapter 24, in which there was a fearful discovery and a whisper of Pope. To the children's great relief, Pitch and his fearlings had disappeared into another chamber. The chamber where they were kept was as wide and as tall as Big Root, but it was nothing like Big Root. This was a dark and fretful place. If Big Root was a treasure chest of wonders, Pitch's lair at the earth's core was like the fabled box of Pandora filled with doom and darkness. The children had managed to ever so quietly wiggle through the openings in their cages and climb down. Half a dozen tunnels led out from the chamber, but tall William and Petter had explored and reported that everyone was being guarded by fearlings. Not that it mattered. The children wouldn't try to escape without nightlight. Fog, Petter, and Sasha stood watch while tall William ran his hands over the door of nightlight's cage seeking a knob, a keyhole, anything that would help them free their friend. But there was nothing, not even a crack. Whatever dark magic Pitch had used when he removed his sword from the lock had left the door smoother than fresh ice on the skating pond in Santoff Closet. Tall William knocked hard to let Nightlight know he was there, then placed his ear against the cage. Did he hear you? Sasha asked, putting her own ear against the metal. Did he knock back? Tall William shook his head. I don't think so. But it's hard to hear anything with all that banging going on. That banging was the incessant clamor of clanking, hammering, striking, coming from the next chamber. Every now and again, it was peppered by the Nightmare King's booming laugh. What do you think Pitch is up to? Petter whispered. Let's find out, tall William whispered back. They crept stealthily to the entrance of the next chamber and peered around the wall, just out of sight of the fearling guards. What they saw made their eyes go wide. Hundreds of fearlings were working furiously under Pitch's direction. Some were chipping away at the lead walls, making the room larger, dropping the lead chips into a bucket. Other fearlings melted buckets of lead over an eerie blue lava. When the lead melted into a sticky liquid, they poured the mixture into molds. Tall William watched uneasily. Something was different about these fearlings. They seemed more solid, less shadowy than the others. 
One of them tested the lead in a mold with a thin rod. It was solid now, and the fearling popped what looked like a heavy vest out of the mold and then handed it to the creature next to him. They passed it from one to the next down the line until it reached a fearling that looked normal, or at least what tall William and the others had come to think of as normal. The creature slipped the object over his shadowy body. Then he too took on a more solid look of the others and skulked into the light. They're making armor, tall William breathed out. Petter stared hard. It covers them completely. Now they'll be able to go out in the sunlight, whispered tall William, struggling to keep the dread out of his voice. Then he saw rows of swords and spears being fashioned from the same thick liquid. I pitch a sword, Petter hissed. They crept back to the others and reported what they had seen. The smaller children just stared after hearing this alarming news. The smallest William hid his head under Fogg's arm. Sasha drew a deep breath to keep her voice steady and said, I wish Holmbrick and the others would hurry. Tall William tried hard not to seem scared, but he was. The fearlings would be too strong for them now with that armor and these weapons, he said quietly. Petter grew more serious. And if they bring Ombrick's library, Pitch will know all the magic there is, he said. It'll be unstoppable. But we mustn't be afraid, he added, trying to convince himself as well as the others. It only makes Pitch, Pitch stronger when we're afraid. The children knew he was right, but it was getting very hard to stay brave. If they'd only been able to hear the conversation that was taking place inside Nightlight's tiny cramped cage. Nightlight was listening to the muffled voice of Mr. Quirky. The cocoon shifted and wiggled under his jacket. Change is coming, said the valiant little worm, and it cannot be stopped. And Nightlight brightened. Chapter 25, The Egg Armada. If there are seven wonders of the known world, Bunny Mun's tunnel to the Earth's core would be the first of the unknown world. It was shaped like an egg standing on end and seemed to go on forever. North was intrigued by how quietly the Puka's train was traveling. Despite their remarkable speed, the train barely made a noise, just a quiet sort of chuckling sound. He'd have to ask the Puka how he managed that. Even the mechanical genie had admitted squeaks and humps. And though Catherine was increasingly worried about Nightlight and her friends, she couldn't help noticing how enticingly strange everything about Bunny Munn's conveyance was. The railroad cars that were whisking them deeper and deeper underground were, of course, egg-shaped, as was virtually every knob, hinge, door, window, light fixture, and mechanical component. It was even more opulent than the llama's flying tower. It's the train they're using to go to the Earth's core. <laughs> Everything is egg-shaped. Plus, the car is immediately behind her and it held, plus the cars immediately behind her, held an imposing army of well-armored warrior eggs wielding an impressive array of weaponry. The smallest eggs were the size of a common chicken's egg, while platoons of other eggs were nearly as big as a good-sized suitcase. And a surprising number of the eggs were huge, more than 10 feet tall. Catherine was very interested about where those eggs could have come from. North, on the other hand, was having a difficult time taking these warrior eggs seriously. They're eggs, he thought to himself. Eggs. But he tried not to betray his doubts and instead asked his host in a tone that at least hinted at politeness. Very pretty eggs, Bunny Mun. Can they, but can they fight? The Puka regarded him evenly, his nose not even twitching. The Greeks thought so at Troy, he replied, sounding a bit bored. Though why they built their clumsy horse instead of an egg, as I suggested, 
I'll never understand. Catherine, sensing another potential argument brewing, thought it best to interrupt. Are we getting close, she asked. At our current rate of speed, we'll be there in exactly 37 clocks, Bunny Mun replied. Clocks? North and Catherine both wondered, then decided not to ask any more questions for a while. Bunny Mun's answers always left them feeling, well, they just weren't sure. Bewildered, uncertain, odd, doomed. Meanwhile, Bunny Mun regarded the two humans. He found himself concerned for them, but why? Here was this headstrong young man so determined to be daring, and the little girl worrying about her friends. Even that lovely goose was all a twitter about the danger the girl faced, so much disorder and upheaval. Still, he had to admit that there was a certain satisfaction in working with others, even humans. Never would he acknowledge that out loud, of course, but the puka had been alone for so many, many years. Having these other creatures about presented a change of pace. The girl did have excellent taste in chocolates, and it was something to be said for adventure. And what was this if not an adventure? Funny Mun's musings were interrupted by an incessant clanging sound. Far off at the moment, but growing louder and closer as his train barreled forward. We're very nearly there, he told the others. Catherine could tell, for she could smell the dank sulfury odor of beerlings. She held her dagger tighter. At the same time, North's sword and Bunny Mun's staff both began to glow. Danger was apparently just ahead. Chapter 26. The now rotten core. Bunnyman ordered the train to stop, and it did so as smoothly as a duck landing on a pond. He, North, and Catherine made their way to the engine car at the front to better see what was ahead. Engineer eggs were still stoking the egg-shaped boiler of the idling engine with egg-shaped clumps of coal. They occur naturally, explained Bunnyman before Catherine could even ask the question. Egg-shaped coal is where diamonds come from. Egg-shaped coal is where diamonds come from. Catherine liked knowing that, but North found the information distracting. Eggs, he groused. You talk too much about eggs. Bunny Moon was offended. I do not. You do too. I do not. Yes, you do. Do not. Do too, Catherine sighed. Here they were, the oldest and wisest creature on earth and the greatest warrior wizard of the age. Yet they were behaving like a pair of brats. She'd been waiting for something like this to happen between them. They'd been aching for a fight since they'd met. Truth be told, she'd expected something more mature from them both. Grown-ups, wizards, and pukas are they all this muddled, she wondered. As the do-nots and do-twos continued unabated, Catherine made her decision. She would ignore them both. She turned to Kailash and told her to go to the back of the train and stay quiet. The gosling honked sadly, but Catherine insisted. As Kailash waddled back to the passenger cars, Catherine climbed down the engine, climbed down from the engine and walked down the tunnel by herself. It was very dim. The walls of the tunnel grew less smooth and crafted. The egg-shaped lanterns that had been affixed to the ceiling for the whole length of the passageway thus far now appeared less and less frequently. As she continued forward, she could barely make out where the tracks ended. The light of the lantern ahead of her, the last one she could see, was mistier than the others had been. Its shine hit in odd directions. Catherine paused, trying to sort out why this was so. The ominous clanking they had heard earlier grew louder and louder. She could feel the reverberations, but she continued forward until she stood under the lantern and its strange glow. The light looked as if it were being blown in the wind. She followed its fading glow as it twisted farther away. But toward what? 
She took a few more steps forward following the light and then, and with each step, the tunnel grew wider and taller, immense in fact. And then to her complete surprise, it stopped, just stopped. A gray vastness loomed in front of her, a giant wall that blocked her from going any farther, but it didn't stop the light. Catherine could see the misty stream of lantern light was actually flowing into this wall of dense, dark, metallic looking rock. And then she knew she was at the earth's core. She approached the wall cautiously, her dagger at the ready. It occurred to her that her weapon couldn't possibly be of use against a wall, but perhaps it could defend against what was on the other side of the wall. So she kept her dagger raised and she listened intently. The sounds from within were deep and menacing, like growling thunder from an approaching storm. She heard what she thought was laughing. Laughing? Could that be possible? Then she realized that it was Pitch's laugh. A cold shiver ran through her soul. Catherine reached into her coat pocket and pulled out the locket she had got from Bombry. She looked at the picture of Pitch's daughter. Again, she felt a strange sort of sadness. She had lost her father before she'd ever really known him, and yet she missed him every day. Their time together had been so brief, but the bond lived on. She knew it would never fade or die. She studied the picture of that long ago little girl and wondered, might this locket be a much more powerful weapon against pitch than any dagger? Then a shift in the lantern's light caught her attention. The light was changing, twisting down and splitting into different threads, fanning out like a web that arched behind her. She spun around, surrounding her, stood a dozen or so fearlings. The tendrils of the lantern light fed directly into their leaded armor. North! Catherine managed to scream before they whisked her away that awful place behind the wall. Chapter 27, The Power of the Inner Puka. Remember, North was saying, glowering at Bunny Mund, Pitch is mine. The puka's nose twitched. Then they heard Catherine scream. North didn't wait for Bunny Mun to respond. He turned on his heels and ran, his sword leading the way as if it couldn't wait to do battle. A knot of fearlings plunged down at him. He could tell at a glance that they were more formidable than any fearlings he'd ever seen before. They looked denser somehow. And though his sword was glowing far more brightly than usual, its light seemed to be sucked into the fearlings themselves. North was startled, but the hilt of the sword wrapped itself tightly around his hand, and this gave him courage. He literally felt himself becoming stronger, faster. He slashed at the marauders as they descended upon him. He would expected them to vanish with one quick touch, but they did not. Instead, he heard the clank of metal against metal as he struck at the fearlings and realized that they were armored like knights of old, but deformed, tangled, and terrible, and armed. How could that be? North managed to think as he lashed out again and again, barely able to stop the fearling's heavy swords from carving him up as they swooped down at him like giant, murderous bats. They swerved in midair to attack again. North willed himself to be stronger and faster still, and as he did, the sword responded. When the fearlings dove at him again, he sliced them down with swift and brutal precision. Their armor hacked open. The fearlings vanished into nothingness. The empty armor fell to the tunnel floor like hunks from a broken coffin. Forth gripped his sword and stood ready for the next onslaught, but none came. In the tense quiet, he had time to think one terrible thought. What has happened to Catherine? The sword seemed to respond, for from its hilt, a small oval mirror emerged. At first, North saw only his own face and Bunny Mun and his army racing from the train behind him. Then the mirror showed another image, blurry at first and sharper. It was Catherine, 
surrounded by fearlings, then it shifted to the face of pitch as it looked down at her. The image faded and the mirror grew dark, reflecting nothing. North gripped his sword so intensely that he began to shake. This is my fault, he thought. He dropped his guard, let himself become distracted by what? By a candy-making rabbit. Bunnyman came up just behind North. Pukas have an uncanny ability to sense what others think and feel. He knew that North thought he was a silly creature, ridiculous even, but that didn't bother him. He could also sense North's anger and determination, his need to help his young friend. The rabbit had kept his distance from the tumultuous feelings of living things for centuries, but now he knew he must respond as he would have in the days of old. He put his paw on North's shoulder in as friendly a way as a puka can. Then he sighed deeply. Dear fellow, he said to North, this will be more difficult than I had imagined. Drastic measures are required. He reached into his robe and pulled out three chocolate eggs. This is no time for sweets, North snapped in frustration. For you, perhaps, said the rabbit. Then he popped the three chocolates in his mouth. The egg army gasped in almost perfect unison. <gasps> None of them had ever seen Bunny Man eat a chocolate. They had only heard rumors of what happened when Pukas ate the substance. There was a curious rumbling. North turned around to face Bunny Man. The rabbit appeared to be growing before his eyes, becoming huge. Hope, like a warrior from a mythology not yet written. Bunny Man raised his egg-tipped staff above his head and let out a yell that shook the tunnel like an earthquake. The army of eggs did likewise. The sound was unlike anything North had ever heard. It was the first time in a thousand years, the world had heard the Pukin war cry. And even Nicholas St. North was impressed. Chapter 28, the battle begins. Pitch had almost no time to relish the capture of Catherine. He knew that if the girl was here, North and Ombrick must be near and the magic library close at hand but moments after the fearlings had brought the girl to him, he heard that extraordinary otherworldly sound. He alone, among all the creatures living, had heard that war cry before. It was a sound he'd hoped to never hear again. He remembered it from the time he'd destroyed the Pukin Brotherhood. It was the one battle of the Golden Age he had nearly lost. They've got a puka with them, he hissed in alarm. They've got a puka with them. He knew he must act quickly. Make ready, he bellowed to his fearling army. The battle begins. The fearlings gathered with enviable swiftness, armor ready, weapons raised. They were a force no one would wish to face. Pitch grabbed Catherine by the collar and dragged her with him. Come, Sprite, he muttered. I've no time to dally with you just now and he rushed from chamber to chamber, shouting commands, making sure his dark army was in place and ready. And all the while, Catherine dangled at his side like a sack. She watched every movement of the fearling troops, which was no easy feat, as she was being buffered about with Pitch's grim grip tight at her neck. But she could see the trap that Pitch was planning. The fearlings would let North and Bunnymun make their way deep into the hollow of the Earth's core and surround and overwhelm them. Her mind raced as Pitch planned to destroy her friends. She plotted how best to stop it. The Pukin war cry grew louder and closer. The egg army had obviously made it through the wall of lead that surrounded Pitch's lair. Time was short. Catherine had so few choices and none played to her favor, but then 
as Pitch was hurrying into another chamber, she saw the metal cages holding the children, her friends. They'd crawled back up into the cages to avoid detection by Pitch. But Tall William and the others could see her as well. They yelled and stuck their hands through the air holes to wave. She tried to shout back, but Pitch swung her suddenly to his other hand. As he did so, she noticed for only an instant that this hand seemed different, changed, almost human looking. Now you remember how the hand that he grabbed Nightlight with? Then she heard the opening of a metal door and she was shoved into a small room. The door slammed behind her. She was immersed in a darkness that was total and complete. And though he did not know it, Pitch had put her in the one place where she most needed to be.